the Sangha is invited to come back to our breathing so that the collective energy of mindfulness will bring us together as an organism, flowing as a river with no more separation. Let the whole Sangha breathe as one body, chant as one body, listen as one body, transcending the boundaries of a delusive self, liberating from the superiority complex, the inferiority complex, and the equality complex.
Um, respected Thai, um, dear brothers and sisters, and dear friends, we would like to invite all of the children um, to stand up and to follow me and uh, Brother Guang Kyu and Brother Frank and Brother Bu. We will go outside um, to the children's room right now. Thank you.
morning, dear Sangha. Today is uh, August 12th, in the year 2013, and we are in Brook University on our second day of the retreat, Happy Teachers, No Change the World. When we hear, when we hear the bell, when we listen to the bell, I might like to invite all the cells in our body to join us in listening. We know that uh, our father, our mother, our ancestors, they are all present in every cell of our body. And we listen in such a way that uh, the energy of peace, mindfulness, will penetrate in every cell of our body. Deep listening. When uh, we hear the bell, if we are used to the practice, we naturally stop our uh, talking, our thinking, our speaking, and begin to focus our attention on our in breath. We breathe in. The pleasure, and we say, I listen. I listen. It means every cell in your body is listening with you. You can say, we listen, we listen. And we allow the sound of the bell and the energy of peace to penetrate into our every cell of our body. And when we breathe out, we say, this wonderful sound brings me back to my true home. My true home is in the here and the now where life is available. And when 1,000 people breathe like that, the energy of mindfulness and peace will be very powerful, can be very nourishing. And the children, if they happen to be sitting with us, they feel that energy. It's very healing, very nourishing. And the best thing you profit from coming to a retreat is that kind of collective energy of mindfulness and, and compassion and peace that has the power to heal. The same thing is true when we, we walk. If everyone focus their attention on the in-breath, the out-breath, and the steps that they make, and then we shall be able to generate a collective energy of peace and mindfulness and joy. And that will be very healing, very nourishing. Well, when we speak of uh, global ethics, we speak about uh, a kind of spiritual practice that anyone can take up regardless of uh, religion, uh, race, nationality, culture. You don't need to be a Buddhist in order to practice mindfulness of breathing. Because when you breathe mindfully, joy, happiness, and healing can happen. In Buddhism, we learn that Buddhism is made of non-Buddhist elements. It's like a flower. When you look into a flower, you see the flower is made uniquely of non-flower elements. When you look into a flower, you see the sunshine. The sunshine is not a flower. Without the sunshine, no flower is possible. When you look into the flower, you see a cloud that give uh, rain. Flower and rain are not flowers, but without the, these non-flower elements, a flower is not possible. So to meditate means to look deeply, and when you look deeply into something, like a flower, you have the insight that that thing, that flower, is made only of non-flower elements. And if you remove any of these non-flower elements, out of the flower, the flower can not continue to be there. 
So the same thing is true with Buddhism. Buddhism is made only of non-Buddhist elements. And if you have that insight, and there, is, there will be no longer any dogmatism, and uh, any kind of uh, uh, belief that can create uh, division and fear and hate. So it's perfectly uh, possible for a non-Buddhist to practice uh, mindfulness. The practice uh, of mindfulness, the practice of global ethics can help us uh, in many ways. First of all, we can release the tension from our body. And this can be done not only by adults, but by children. We have organized uh, retreats for children, and they practice very well. The children are more capable of being in the present moment than us adults. There is tension in our body. We have allowed tension to be accumulated a lot in our body, and that is the foundation of many kinds of diseases. So the practice of mindful breathing can help us release the tension in our body. Whether we are sitting on a bus, uh, in the classroom, or in the, uh, at the airport, uh, practicing mindful breathing can help release the tension. And if uh, the tension is gone, the amount of pain in our body will be reduced. Our pain is in function of our tension. So if we can release the tension, we can reduce also the pain in our body. In whatever position we find ourselves in, lying, sitting, standing, walking, we can always release tensions. In the sitting meditation, you can release all tension from your face, from your shoulders, and you just enjoy breathing. You don't, you don't fight while you sit in meditation. You allow yourself to, to be relaxed, to release all kinds of tensions. There are about uh, 300 muscles on our face. And when they are tense, they don't look very beautiful. <laughs> and if you know how to breathe in and smile, and then all the tension in these 300 muscles will, will go right away, very quickly. So everyone can learn to release uh, the tension in their body, whether, uh, whether they are uh, walking or sitting, or lying down, and so on. And we can do that uh, at any time of the day, and wherever we are. And then the, the practice of mindfulness can help us uh, generate the energy of joy and happiness. A good practitioner can, can bring in a joyful feeling at any time she likes to. A good practitioner can bring in a feeling of happiness whenever she wants to. And this is, not, it is simple enough uh, and everyone can do. We know that uh, when, we, when we breathe in and if we focus our attention on our in-breath, we bring our mind home to our body. And when mind and body are together, something happens. We are fully established in the here and the now. The mind is uh, 
an embodied mind. When mind is with the body, you are truly alive. You are truly there, fully present. And you are in a position to get in touch with all the wonders of life that are around you and inside of you. And you might find out that conditions for joy and happiness are already there, more than enough to bring in a joyful feeling, a happy feeling. Mindfulness allowed us to see that we are very lucky, we are much luckier than many other people. Suppose we uh, breathe in and focus our attention on our eyes. Breathing in, I'm aware of my eyes, mindfulness of eyes. And insight might come right away. Oh, my eyes are still in good condition. And since you have eyes still in good condition, a paradise of forms and colors is available. You need only to open your eyes and the paradise is yours. That those of us who have lost our eyesight, the paradise is not for us anymore, any longer. And our deepest desire is to, to restore our eyesight. So focusing our attention on our eyes, which are still in good conditions, we touch one of the conditions of happiness that we do have in the present moment. And there are thousands of conditions like that inside of, inside of us. When you breathe in and you become aware of your heart, breathing in, I'm aware of my heart, find mindfulness of heart, you find out you get inside that your heart still functions normally. How wonderful to have a heart that still functions normally. There are those of us who wish to have such a heart because they are subjected to the risk of uh, uh, having a heart attack. And the deepest desire is to have a normal heart like ours. So a heart is another condition of peace and happiness that we do have. So in the practice of the contemplation of the body, in the body, we get in touch with the whole body and we realize that uh, there are so many conditions of uh, happiness that are in our body, in our mind, and around us more than enough for us to be joyful and to be happy right in the here and the now. We do not need to run into the future and to look for more conditions of happiness because we do have more than enough conditions to be happy right here and right now. So based on that kind of awareness, a good practitioner can generate a feeling of joy at any time he wants by touching the conditions of happiness that are already available. And the same thing is true with uh, happiness. Conditions of happiness are already there, more than enough. And if uh, with mindfulness you recognize these conditions, and then happiness can come right away. So generating a feeling of joy, generating a feeling of happiness is what a good practitioner can do at any time. So in global ethics, we learn how to release the tension in our body, to reduce the pain in our body, to generate a feeling of joy, to generate a feeling of uh, happiness. You know, the French have uh, a song, Qu'est-ce qu'on attend pour être heureux? What do we need? What do we wait? Uh, why don't we be happy right, right now? 
And then the practice of mindfulness also helps us to handle a painful feeling, a painful emotion. When a practitioner knows a painful feeling is coming up, she knows what to do in order to take care of that uh, painful feeling or that painful emotion that is coming up. And a good practitioner, a good practitioner knows how to handle a strong emotion, a painful emotion, or a painful feeling. And she can get uh, relief after a few minutes of practice. And if she continues with uh, the practice, she will be able to transform that feeling of uh, pain into something else. Much better, a feeling of joy a feeling of happiness. So a good practitioner how to knows how to handle suffering. She is not afraid of suffering. With the energy of mindfulness, she can recognize suffering. She can hold suffering. She can bring a relief. And she can even go further, transform the suffering. There is a deep connection between suffering and happiness. And most of us uh, have the habit of trying to run away from suffering. And we do not know that suffering can be useful. It's like uh, when you grow lotus flowers, you need the mud. Lotus flowers cannot grow on marble. Without the mud, you cannot grow lotus. The same thing is true with uh, happiness and suffering. A good practitioner knows how to make good use of suffering in order to grow happiness. We can speak about the goodness of suffering. If we know how to embrace suffering, to hold it tenderly, to look deeply into it, and then we will be able to generate the energy of compassion and understanding, which are at the foundation of true happiness. Because no true happiness is possible without uh, understanding and compassion. Without understanding and compassion, you are utterly alone. You cannot relate to any living being. And that is why we learn that uh, the true foundation of happiness is uh, understanding and compassion. And understanding is, first of all, understanding of the suffering, the suffering inside of us, and the suffering in the other person. To me, the kingdom of God is not a place where there is no suffering. If there is no suffering there, and then there will be no happiness either. In the Buddhist tradition, we speak of uh, the nature of interbeing. You cannot be by yourself alone. You have to interbe with all of us. Suppose we speak about this uh, sheet of paper. You have the left and you have the right. The left cannot be by itself alone. It has to lean on the right in order to express itself. You cannot detach the left from the right. The same thing is true with the right. You cannot ask someone to come and bring the right to Boston and and someone else to bring the left to New York. They like to be together. They they need each other. So the same thing is true with suffering and happiness.
if you send your children to a place where it, there is no suffering, what will happen? They have no, no chance to learn how to be understanding and to be compassionate. It is by touching suffering, understanding suffering, that love and compassion can be born. It is by the mud, with the mud, that the lotus flower can, can grow. So we should see the deep connection between left and right, happiness and suffering, the inside and the outside, the mind and the body. We have to learn how to abandon our dualistic way of looking at things. So the practitioner not only knows how to handle suffering, but he knows also how to make good use of suffering in order to create compassion, understanding, and happiness. So the attitude uh, many people adopt trying to run away from the suffering is not uh, wise. In fact, we have to go home to ourselves, recognize the suffering inside of us, listen deeply to that suffering, hold it tenderly, and learn from it. And we know how to create understanding and compassion that will transform us and help transform the other person. And that is why we should speak about the goodness of suffering, la bienfaisance de la souffrance. And then a good uh, practitioner knows how to, to listen. Because she knows how to listen to herself, to her own suffering. Now she is capable of listening to the suffering of the other person. The other person may be our partner, may be our father, our son, our daughter. There is suffering in him, in her. And if we have uh, understood our own suffering, it will be much easier for us to recognize and understand the suffering in him or in her. When we are able to recognize the presence of suffering in that person and see that he and she has been victim of that suffering because that person, no one has helped that person how to handle the suffering in them. So you may be the first one that can help him or her to suffer less. And that is why looking at that person, you are not angry anymore. And you are motivated by the desire to say something or to do something in order to help him or her suffer less. It means compassion is in your heart. Understanding is in your heart because you have been able to listen and to understand your own suffering. Now it's time for you to listen and understand the suffering of that person and help him, help her to suffer less. And a good practitioner can go further. She is now able to listen with compassion to what did the other person have to say. And she can use uh, the kind of language called a loving speech, gentle speech, in order to help the other person to open his heart. When someone suffers so much, that person closes the door of his heart. And if we know how to be compassionate, how to use loving speech, and then we be able to open the door of his heart and help him to empty his heart so that he will suffer less. Darling, I know that you have suffered so much in the past many years. 
I was not able to help you. In fact, I have reacted in such a way that makes you suffer. I am sorry. That's because I did not uh, understand your suffering, your difficulties. That is why I have reacted in such a way. I need your help, darling. I need you to tell me about your difficulty, your suffering, your despair. So I, so that I will not react the way I have in the past. If you don't help me, who will? Mm. When we have compassion in our heart, we can speak with that kind of language. And that kind of language will be able to open the heart of a person and she will tell you what is in her heart. And now you have the chance to practice uh, compassionate listening. Compassionate listening is the kind of uh, deep listening that can help the other person to suffer less in one hour or less. And inside of every one of us, there is uh, a dormant uh, Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara. We have to help the Bodhisattva to, to become alive again so that we can, we can practice, we can help, uh, we can uh, practice deep listening so that we can bring relief to the other person. Just listen with compassion. Compassionate listening means you keep compassion alive in your heart during the whole time of listening. You breathe in mindfully, you breathe out mindfully, and you remember just one thing. I am listening to him or to her just with one purpose. Allow him to suffer less to speak out and to suffer less. Just remember that. And if you, you keep that kind of awareness alive, you are protected by the energy of compassion. And what the other person say will not touch off uh, irritation and anger in you. You are protected by the energy of compassion. If you don't practice mindfulness of compassion, you are not protected. And what the other person say may be full of uh, bitterness, blames, accusations, and that will touch off the irritation, the anger in you, and you lose your capacity of listening. And that is why mindfulness of breathing, mindfulness of compassion, help you to be a real listener and if you can listen with compassion for one hour, you help the other person suffer much less. You tell yourself, well, he is victim of so many wrong perceptions, but I am not going to interrupt him right now and correct him right now. If I do, I will transform this session into a debate. I will ruin everything. I just listened and allowed him to have a chance to empty his heart. And later on, in three, five days, I will offer him some information so that he can correct his perception, but not now. That is mindfulness of compassion. And if you can keep that mindfulness of compassion alive during the time you listen, you can heal that person. You can help him or her empty their heart and suffer less. And you play the role of the Bodhisattva of deep listening. You are the Bodhisattva. And four days, five days of practice may be enough for you to play the role of a Bodhisattva of deep listening. We have offered so many uh, retreats of mindfulness everywhere in Europe, in North America. And the miracle of reconciliation always 
takes place in our retreat. In the first uh, four days, uh, we allow the good seeds in us to be watered, the seeds of understanding, compassion, and so on. We learn how to listen to our own suffering. We learn how to look at the suffering of the other person. We suffer less after four days of practice. We learn how to speak uh, gently and with compassion. We learn how to listen with uh, deep compassion. And on our fifth day, the fifth day of the retreat, we are encouraged to put into the practice the practice of deep listening and loving speech in order to reconcile with the other person. The other person may be in the retreat and she may have, she has been exposed to the same teaching and practice. That is why it's easier. But if the other person is at home and then you are allowed to use your portable telephone and practice. And that happened on the fifth day. And many, many have reported to us that uh, they have on the fifth day. We say, Gen- ladies and gentlemen, you have until midnight tonight in order to do that. Restore communication and reconcile. And many people have used their telephone to practice uh, compassionate listening and reconcile with their father, their mother, their son, their daughter, with the practice of deep listening and loving speech. So the miracle of reconciliation always happens in our retreat. I'm sure that if uh, parents and school teachers um, take up this practice, they will be able to transform their family and their class into a very pleasant place to live in and uh, to grow love and happiness. Global ethics can be described in these uh, terms of practice. How to release the tension in your body, how to reduce the amount of pain in your body, preventing many kinds of disease that grow on the ground of uh, tension and stress. Learn how to generate a feeling of joy a feeling of happiness for yourself and for your loved one, loved ones. How to handle a painful feeling, a painful emotion. How to listen, how to speak in such a way that you can restore communication and bring about uh, reconciliation. And of course, uh, You don't need to be a Buddhist in order to do all these things. And you can very well uh, bring that practice uh, into school. And um, and, and make uh, the teaching and the learning into something pleasant, wonderful. There is a text called uh, Mindfulness of Breathing. 
and in which the Buddha proposed uh, 16 exercises on mindful breathing. It's very practical. And everyone can do it. Not complicated. And you can already uh, notice the effect of the practice after one or two hours. The first exercise is so simple. To be aware of your in-breath and out-breath. This is what we practice this morning. Breathing in, I know this is an in-breath. To identify the in-breath as in-breath and to identify the out-breath as an out-breath. Breathing in, I know I am breathing in. This is so simple. And yet the effect can be great. Aware of uh, Aware of in-breath and out-breath. As you breathe in, you pay attention to your in-breath only. Your in-breath becomes the only object of your mind. And if you are truly focused, mindful on your in-breath, you release everything else. You release the past, you release the future, your projects, your fear, your anger. Because the mind has only one object at a time. And the object of the mind now is the in-breath. Breathing in, I know I am breathing in. So you focus uh, your mind on your in-breath and you release everything else and you become free. There is uh, regret concerning the past, sorrow concerning the past. There is a fear and uncertainty concerning the future. All of that you release in just one or two seconds because you are focusing all your mind into your in-breath. So breathing in mindfully, breathing in mindfully sets you free. You have freedom. And if you are to make a decision, it's better that you have enough freedom to make it. You are not under the influence of anger, fear, and your decision is much better than if you are not free. So just breathing in makes you free. And it is pleasant also. It's pleasant to breathe in. So the exercise is so simple, but the effect can be great. The second exercise is to follow your in-breath all the way through and to follow your out-breath all the way through. And you may enjoy these two exercises at any time and anywhere. Breathing in, I follow my in-breath from the beginning to the, to the, to the end. Suppose this marker represents my in-breath. It begins here. And this finger is my mind. I'm breathing in. I follow my in-breath all the way through. There is no interruption at all. Not a millisecond of interruption. So during the time you breathe in mindfully, you cultivate concentration. You are not only mindful of your in-breath, but you concentrate on your in-breath. The energy of mindfulness carries within herself the energy of concentration. 
And it is also pleasant because uh, to be mindful and to concentrate on your in-breath can be very pleasant. You don't have to suffer. In fact, you can feel wonderful just breathing in, especially when the air is fresh and if the nose is free. So the second uh, exercise is uh, to follow your in-breath and your out-breath all the way through. And we know that we can do these two exercises anytime we, we like. The, take, the third exercise is to be aware of your body. Breathing in, I'm aware of my body. You bring your mind home to your body. And your mind becomes an embodied mind. They will help you to be established in the here and the now. You are fully present, you are fully alive. And you can live that moment of your daily life more deeply if body and mind are together. The oneness of body and mind is what you realize with the third exercise. When you are with your, when you spend two hours with your computer, you forget entirely that you have a body. You are not truly really alive in that moment. You are truly alive only when the mind is with the body. You are fully in the here and the now, and you touch the wonders of life in you and around you. Many of our brothers and sisters in Plum Ridge, they, they program a bell mindfulness in their computer. And every 15 minutes, they hear the bell, they stop working, they go back and enjoy their in-breath and out-breath, smile and enjoy their body and release the tension in their body. And that is what the Buddha recommended 2,600 years ago. That's the fourth exercise. Breathing in, I calm my body. I release the tension. in my body. When you come back to your body, you may notice that there is a lot of tension in your body. And then you may like to do something in order to help your body to have more peace, to suffer less. And with your out breath, you allow the tension to be released. And that is the first four exercises of mindful breathing recommended by the Buddha so that uh, we can take good care of our body. <clears throat> and with the fifth exercise, we go to the realm of the feeling. The fifth exercise is to generate a feeling of joy. Generating joy. A good practitioner knows how to generate a feeling of joy. Because she knows that mindfulness allowed her to recognize all the happy conditions, conditions of happiness that are already available. We can remind ourselves and we can remind our beloved one that we are very lucky. We can be happy right here and right now 
You don't have to go to run into the future to look for happiness. There is a teaching given by the Buddha. It is the teaching of uh, living happily in the present moment. Life is available only in the present moment. And uh, if you go back to the present moment, you will notice that there are so many conditions of happiness already available, and that is why joy and happiness can be born right away. The expression living happily in the present moment was found in a sutra Five times, the Buddha was teaching uh, Anatta Pinika, a businessman in the city of Shravasti. That day, uh, Anatta Pinika, the businessman, came with uh, many hundred, uh, many hundreds of uh, businessmen to visit the Buddha. And the Buddha gave them the teaching. Gentlemen, he said, you can be happy right here and right now. You don't have to run in the, to the future. You don't have to look for success in the future in order to be happy. I think the Buddha knew very well that businessmen, they think a little bit too much about the future, their success. And that is why the expression living deeply, living happily in the present moment was used by the Buddha five times in the same, the same sutra, the same scripture. Drista Dharma Sukha Vihara. Vihara means to dwell, to live. Sukha means happily. And this Dharma is uh, the present moment. Hiền Pháp là tu. So a good practitioner does not look for happiness in the future. He knows how to go home to the present moment and recognize all the conditions of happiness that are available and make joy and happiness available right away. And she does that for herself and she does that for the other person. Creating happiness is an art, the art of happiness. So the fifth uh, exercise is to generate joy, and the sixth is to generate happiness. And the seventh is uh, to be aware of a painful feeling or emotion. Breathing in, I know there is a painful feeling, a painful emotion that is coming up in me. So the practitioner does not try to fight the pain to cover up the pain inside, or to try to run away from the, from the pain. In fact, because she is a practitioner, she knows how to generate energy of mindfulness. And with that energy, she recognizes the pain, and she embraces the pain tenderly. 
Hello, my, my little pain, I know you are there. I will take good care of you. Whether that is anger or fear or jealousy or despair. We have to be there for our, for, for our pain. There is no fighting. There is no violence done to, 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 to our suffering. Yesterday we spoke about um, a mother holding the crying baby. So our pain, our suffering is uh, our baby. And the uh, energy of mindfulness generated by our practice is the loving mother. And the mother has to recognize that the uh, baby suffers and she takes the baby up and holds the baby tenderly into her arm. And that is exactly what a good practitioner will do when a painful feeling arises. You have to be there for your painful feeling or emotion. You continue to breathe uh, and to walk in such a way that the energy of mindfulness continues to be produced. And with that uh, energy of mindfulness, you recognize the pain and you embrace the pain uh, tenderly. In Buddhism, we speak of uh, consciousness in terms of uh, store and mind. Uh. There is at least two layers of consciousness. And the lower layer is called store consciousness. Our fear, our anger, our despair, are there in the bottom of our consciousness in form of seeds. There is a seed of anger here. And if the seed of anger accepts to sleep quietly down there, we are okay. We can laugh, we can have a, a good time. But if someone come and say something, or do something and touch off that seed of anger, it will come up as a source of energy. Down here, it is called a seed. Chúng tử. Bây giờ. And when it comes up here, on the level of mind consciousness, it becomes a kind of energy called mental formation. And this is the mental formation called anger. So when the practitioner notices that anger is coming up, she right away breathes and invite the seed of mindfulness to come up as energy. Mindfulness is another seed that is here. And if we are a good practitioner, the seed of mindfulness in us has grown to, be, to become a very important uh, seed. We need to touch lightly, and then there will be a lot of that energy coming up for us to use. And if we are not a practitioner, the seed of mindfulness is there, but very tiny. And if you practice mindful breathing, mindful walking every day, the seed continues to grow. 
And whenever you need that energy, you just touch. And you have a powerful source of energy to help you to deal with uh, whatever happening up, uh, up there. So the practitioner begins to breathe or to work mindfully. And the, man, the second mental formation is manifest on this level. Another mental formation, and this one is mindfulness. So it is the energy of mindfulness that will take care of, of the energy of anger. There is no fighting. Mindfulness does uh, at least two things. First of all, to recognize. A simple recognition of uh, the pain. And that is uh, the seventh exercise. Breathing in, I know anger is in me. Our despair is in me. Our jealousy is in me. Recognize simply, not fighting. And the second thing mindfulness will do is to embrace. And that is uh, seen in the exercise, is to calm, to calm down the pain. Like a mother holding the baby. The mother does not know what is wrong with the baby. But the fact that she's holding the baby gently can help the baby suffer less right away. The same thing is true with uh, the practitioner. She does not know what is the cause of that kind of anger or fear. But the fact that she is holding, recognizing and holding that energy of fear and anger can help her suffer less right away after one or two minutes. So this is uh, the art of uh, suffering. This is the art of happiness. How to generate a feeling of joy and happiness. How to take care of a painful feeling and emotion. How to calm it down, how to get a relief. And with the exercises that follow, you can go further and you can transform pain, sorrow, fear into something more positive, like making good use of the mud in order to grow lotus flowers. So a good practitioner is not afraid of pain. She does not try to run away from the pain. In fact, she tried to be with the pain. She knows she know how to handle a feeling of pain, an emotion, a strong emotion. And she knows how to make good use of that mud in order to create uh, understanding and compassion which are factors of true happiness. So with uh, roboetics, with um, the practice of mindfulness, with a spiritual dimension in our daily life, we know how to overcome difficulties that present themselves in our daily life. And that is why each one of us should bring a spiritual dimension to our daily life. Without that kind of practice, you don't know how to handle the difficulties that that come every day. The image of uh, a mother holding the baby 
is very helpful. If your mindfulness is uh, powerful enough, you embrace your pain, your sorrow. You continue to breathe or to practice walking meditation. It's like giving uh, your fear, your anger, a mindfulness bath. Maybe three minutes, maybe five, ten minutes. After that, she will lose some of her strength and go back to the original place down there in store consciousness. After having taken a mindfulness bath, she go down to the store and go back to where she, she had been there, losing some of her strength. That is the power of, of, uh, of uh, mindfulness. And uh, in the Buddhist tradition, we speak about 51 categories of mental formations. And as a novice monk, I had to, to know by heart all these uh, 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 mental formations, so that every time one of them come up, I should be able to call it by its true name. Hello, my fear, I know your name. I'm going to take good care of you. Recognizing and embracing. That's the first step of practice. There are wholesome, positive uh, seeds down here. And we mentioned mindfulness. We mentioned concentration. We mentioned insight. You mentioned nonviolence, you mentioned joy, you, men, you mentioned compassion, and many good things down there. And as a good practitioner, we know how to recognize them and help them to come up as uh, frequently as possible. Because they will make the landscape of the mind consciousness beautiful. And we are happy if we know how to how to invite them to manifest as mental formations up here. As for the negative, unwholesome mental formations like fear, anger, despair, you better keep them down there. Do not give them a chance to come up. And they will grow weaker and weaker and weaker. We do that for ourselves and we do that we help our beloved one to do the same. If we speak about the life of a school teacher, we know that uh, there is suffering inside of uh, the teacher, and there is also suffering inside of the students. And that is why if uh, school teachers know how to handle their own suffering, if teachers know how to generate joy and happiness, they will become happy teachers. They will suffer less. 
And uh, when they go to their class, they can help their students to do the same. During the last two decades of the last century, there was a professor of mathematics here in Toronto. He taught at the French uh, Toronto School, Toronto, Toronto School, uh, French School. He, he came to a retreat uh, organized in Montreal. He came back and he tried to put into the practice uh, the practice of mindful breathing and walking. His name is uh, Henry Kiku, and he is a uh, uh, director of the uh, program of uh, mathematics in the Toronto uh, French School. Two journalists from the, um, the Globe and Mail uh, came to his class, interview him. Uh, was about to, uh, and was about to uh, ask him why did he introduce uh, Buddhism into his class. This is forbidden here in Canada. And then he uh, invited uh, the two journalists to come to his class and see how he, he taught his uh, students. The day he came home from the retreat, and resume his class. He walked in mindfully, slowly and mindfully. And he came up to the blackboard and he raised things mindfully. And the student asked him, Papa, are you, are you sick? <laughs> Papa, ask you a malad? No, I'm not sick. I practice in mindfulness. <laughs> So he told the students about, um, about, um, about what he has learned in uh, the retreat, breathing, walking, easing, calming, and so on. And he proposed that every half an hour, 15 minutes, a boy would clap his hand three times replacing the bell of mindfulness, and everyone practice mindful breathing in and out to calm themselves. And the class made a lot of uh, progress. There's a lot of joy and progress in his class. And he taught in, uh, in many classes of um, mathematics that way. So when the two journalists came, they witnessed that. Teacher and students sit down and enjoy breathing together and burst out laughing together. And every time they hear that, everyone stops teaching, learning, and enjoy breathing in and out. And that has a good impact on the learning and the teaching of the school. So that when the time for retirement came, they asked him to stay for another three years. And other classes have, uh, have adapted his, uh, his way of, uh, of teaching. So for a teacher, for a school teacher, the first thing to do is to go home to himself or herself. The way out is in. Go, go back to oneself and take care of oneself. Learning how to generate a feeling of joy, learning how to generate a feeling of happiness, learning how to handle a painful feeling, a painful emotions, 
listening to the suffering, allowed understanding and compassion to be born and suffer less. This is the first step. And he, she has to do that. That is the first step. And a Sangha, a community of practice in the neighborhood can help him, can help her to deepen that practice. You have to begin with yourself. And then the person of the school teachers, the school teacher has also members of his family. A partner, uh, children, like that. So after he has done it for himself, he can help the other person to do the same. It's much easier. When you have not changed yourself, it's very difficult to help change the other person, to help him or her suffer less. So with loving speech and deep listening, with more peace and gentleness in, in yourself, you become more pleasant, and that is why you can help the other person much more easily. And she or he will, will have mm. to do the same thing. And we become co-practitioner. We share the same value. We share the same spiritual practice. Because we know that each day the situation improves. There's more peace, less suffering, more joy, more happiness. And the children will uh, profit from that. because the children can practice very well also. And when you have a united, harmonious, harmonious family, then you can bring that into your workplace. Then maybe first you have your class, and you transform your class. Your class become a happier place. The class can become a family because there are many children who are unfortunate. Their parents are not in good terms with each other. They fight, they make each other suffer, and the child has, no, has had no chance to learn what love is. And the class, the classroom might be the second chance for the child. And a school teacher can play the role of a father or of a mother and teach the, the young person how to love. What is, what is love? Love is something real. I remember this uh, summer opening in Plum Village. Uh, there was a a child that came up for, for questions and answers, and she made the whole uh, Sangha cry. She said that uh, her parents are divorced. They, fight, they fought each other. They make each other suffer. And when they come, uh, they still fight each other in front of the child. And the child asks, what is love? I don't, I don't know what, what is love. Why do they fight so much? And in, in, even in front of us, many people cry. Very disturbing. So it is possible to give uh, children like uh, that one a second chance by transforming Mm, the classroom into a, into a family. And Henry Kuhn was able to do so. And there are other class in the school, and there is the administration. And of course, we will do uh, everything in order to improve the quality of life, the quality of teaching and learning in the whole school.
we continue tomorrow.